Hi. In this segment of our talk with John Lustig about Karl Barks, we go into his fan base and how it was many years before Karl Barks even discovered he had a fan base and what that was like to find that. So I want to talk a little bit about the fans um, in, in that approach, because at this time he was starting to actually find out he had fans and such. And I think, yeah, I do have this slide here. Now. Okay, good. And um, good. Go ahead. You just explain this slide because this is a slide you provided for me. Just explain what we're saying. Okay. Uh, the fellow on the left, who I later met, um, um, uh, Malcolm Willits, uh, was a a Disney Duck fan. But uh, let's see. So this was '61. So sometime in the late. 50s, maybe early 60s, but um, he somehow, I think he wrote to Western and somebody slipped up and they actually told him Carl's name because they were keeping it a secret. And what, what were they instructed to say? If they were not supposed to give Carl's name, they didn't literally say Walt Disney is drawing these things still, were they? No, no, I, I don't know what they said. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm sure there's some discussion of somewhere in Duckdom about that, but I can't tell you what it was. Okay. But um, Malcolm, and I reread something about this recently. Um, he was he was busy, life and so forth. And he uh, uh, was in correspondence with another Duck fan. And, and at this point, all nobody knew who Carl was. They just referred to him as the good artist or the good duck artist because um, there were all these other Disney comics, uh, many featuring the ducks. And there was just this huge discrepancy between the quality of Carl's stories and most, I'll just say it, all of the others. Um, not that there weren't some good stories, I'm sure, but, um, Anyway, so Malcolm was uh, uh, corresponded with another Duck fan and uh, I think it was Bill Spicer. And he told um, Spicer, I guess it was, um, uh, Carl's name and they might've had Carl's address. And I think Spicer wrote to him, uh, to Carl that is. And I think that might have been the the letter that Carl got that he thought it was a fake. Mm -hmm. um, Russ um, Russ Myers lived nearby and he thought it was a, a, a fa you know a joke by Russ Myers trying to pull one on him. Is and, there any? Does anyone know what that letter contained? I mean, what what information it had? I'm, made I'm, sure, I'm sure. I'm sure. It's very likely that it there's it's out there somewhere, but I don't know. I, I haven't told you, but I ended up buying a, a bunch of um, letters from the Barks estate, and I, I haven't gone through all that stuff, but I've got my my original letters that I wrote to Carl and his responses, because he always made carbons of everything, so. I think um, you need to go through those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, sure it's, it's, I'm sure there's many more than besides the um, Oh, if I was still living up there, I I'd, I'd go with them over them with you. I'd be, I'd be fascinating to see letters, old letters like that. But anyway, I digress. Anyway, um, but anyway, Carl just didn't believe it. But anyway, mm -hmm. this Carl had a lot of ties to the Pacific Northwest. First of all, he's in Oregon, which is you know it's it uh, you know right below Washington State, but. Um, you know, this says Seattle University. I don't know if it's actually Seattle University or if it's, uh, they mean University of Washington and the, the University District. That, but it, There is a Seattle well, University, though. There is a case. Seattle University. Yeah. I, it may be that. Um, 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 but anyway, but Carl, Carl's, um, one of his ex-wives, moved here and uh, he, the one who had his two daughters and they all lived up in the, in Washington state and uh, 
at least somewhat, at least in one case in the Seattle area, um, I met Carl's grandson who lived up in the Seattle area when I went down for Carl's funeral. Uh, and um, yeah, anyway, so he had so a lot of ties and, and is the managers of his bark of the barks um, um, of the bark the, studio, excuse me, uh, lived in uh, up in the Bothell Kenmore area, which is like a half hour away. And I used mm -hmm. to get together with them. Uh, this is before I even met Carl. So in the case with Malcolm, I mean, how did that process of him actually getting to meet them? I mean, did he just simply call them and say, you don't know me, but well, I'd like to meet I, you. Do you even know? I, I, I don't know exactly, but um, I think uh, once the log jam was uh, broken and uh, Carl apparently wrote back to, I, again, I believe it was Bill Spicer. Um, um, you know, Malcolm felt free to, to write to Carl. And, um, you know, I think initially Carl was flabbergasted and he was curious, you know, about fans. He wasn't overwhelmed by fans as he was later on. I'm surprised his initial reaction was an outrage, just pure rage that they kept this from him. Mm, it's it's possible he was upset, but uh, oh, I, sure. I've never heard anything about that, to be honest, either from Carl or elsewhere. Interesting. Uh, well, needless to say, this certainly started a tidal wave because he went from not knowing he had fans to see, meeting his the the fan that I guess, for lack of a better word, outed him to becoming um, an icon that was global. Um, and, you know, we, we mentioned about how at times it just got to be overwhelming. Right. But on top of not of just having fan mail, he also got um, negative, started getting negative letters, too. He started seeing that. And we, we, were, we were talking about the subject of censorship. And I had something here I kind of wanted to read. I just thought this was great. Okay. But and I don't remember the name of the story, but there was a story that ended with the, Donald and the nephews driving off in the distance. And it ended with Donald just simply telling the nephews to shut up. And apparently a letter came in from um, to Western from a parent who was very upset mm -hmm. that he used the word shut up in a comment. thought that was really crude and, and very un-Disney-like. And apparently Western in turn got in touch with um, uh, Carl Barks and said, you know, we believe the woman has a point. And in, in, in our purview, we here at Western, we prefer the word quiet as opposed to shut up. We think it's much more accepting. And um, Carl Barks wrote a nice letter in return. I, I just got a little bit of it here I'm going to read <laughs> out. But, and, and it says here, yeah, it is, yeah. from now on, you will see changed stories coming from this former breeding place of vice. You will see stories that will cause the offended mother to write another letter to say that she just loves the Donald Ducks. For every time she reads one to her little nose-picking crybaby, he goes to sleep in the middle of the second page. And I'm curious, <laughs> of course it went on, but... Um, it, it sounds like Carl Burks had a side to him where he was just, uh, you know, you know, he, he was he was a very calm and collected guy, but you push him too far and he's just like, okay, enough. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, yeah. I, it, it, it's, it's not in line with uh, most of what he presented to the public and so forth, but yeah. Um, First of all, there's a mischievous element to this, to put a, a nice term on it, to this uh, letter. Uh, and Carl had that in his personality. Um, I, I think he knew his worth and he knew that this was nonsense. But, um, you know, I mean, after doing ducks for how many decades? Uh, uh, I don't know when this, oh, it was the 50s, so he'd been doing it maybe 10 years. Um, yeah, you know, times were changing, but not for the best. Um, 
Yeah. Well, you know, he, I think it got to a point he was, he was starting to get a lot of requests through fan mail, you know, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. And, and I think that, you know, he and his wife, Gary, um, were, were, were starting to, particularly in, in the case of Gary, was, was concerned for his well being and didn't want him to just be all of a sudden be start taking advantage of because of his popularity, understandably so. Other people just asking for constant sketches and things like this and reply. And that's, I mean, just for anybody out there, that's a lot to ask for. I mean, you get mountains of, of fan mail and stuff. You, you're still drawing comics and you'd be sitting there and trying to like draw sketches for everyone on earth as well. <laughs> it's really asking a lot. It is. But, yeah. So. And this is, and this is before, you know, the practice of going to comic book conventions and in uh, some cases asking like 30 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever you can command for just a signature, much less uh, drawing. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, let's take a quick break. I gotta let the dog out. She's at the door. Uh, so we'll just pause it for a moment. Okay. And everyone can just kind of step up and stretch it out. Good. Okay. So next, I'm going to have a little fun here. So I, I'm going to get your assessment. I, I, I'm going to name some people um, oh. connected with uh, the Ducks comics. Um, and I'm curious to get your 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 opinion on their their skills as far as like what they what they bring to the picture that that's kind of like also mirroring uh, what Karl Barks you know created, but also kind of creating their own uh, identity as well. I just think it would be kind of interesting to like give you some names. I just want to get some feedback from you on these different people. Okay. Okay. So this is something that wasn't in your notes. So, okay. First name, Dan Yippus. I love Dan stuff. Um, uh, I've worked, well, I say I worked with him. I've, I've had stories drawn by him and knowing Besides Van Horn, he's the only person I've known uh, that when I've, I've written a story that I knew he was going to draw it. Um, uh, um, I know some of Yippus's uh, later style uh, might be a little too um, mannered or something for some people, but I some people, but I shouldn't even say that. I um, but. I really love his work. I think um, I know Van Horn really loves his work too. And it, um, I think there's two artists. Well, Van Horn has a certain element of Carl. Um, the other artist who. Um, well, let's just okay. okay. Let's just focus okay. on Dan Yippus. Yippus, I'm gonna, Yippus I'm probably going to name those artists. You know? Yes, and, and and Yippus is has been Egmont's choice to draw um, stories that I've where I've finished uh, a bark script or where uh, Yippus has finished a bark script on his own or or so. You know, he's sort of the Barks artist these days. Meaning his style kind of clo- more closely mirrors what Barks was producing his style. Yeah, there's definitely a difference, but um, he's when they want to get close to Barks these days, they go to Yippus. There's a fluidity to Barks' style of drawing the characters. Right. It's not, he's not, it's kind of a hybrid. He's not sitting there trying to be that anatomically correct. Uh, obviously, with like the arms and things like that, and the way they 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 they, they attach, uh, and I'm talking about Bart's here, but but at the same time, it works. It's not 
I, I wouldn't call it rubber hose technology like we would see from like the 1920s Mickey Mouse and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But and, and I guess also like with with Yippus, and I'm, I'm a little familiar with his work. I we really don't get to see a, enough of it here in the United States. It's primarily a, a European thing. But although, um, it, although if you look at the early Gladstone comics, uh, the covers are all by Yippus. Although his style, they, was, style was a somewhat different then. Were they, when you say all, are, are you being literal? Most, you know, if it wasn't using oh. Mark's art for the most part, if they were having somebody, they commissioned somebody to draw a new cover, it was Yippus. In the okay. Early. Yeah, I think there would be times Honestly, where I would see some of those, I know what you're talking about. I would see some of those covers and I'd be like, that's a Barks cover. And then I'd find mm -hmm. out, oh, it's a, it's a Yippus cover, you know? Right, it's like, right, right. It, it was close enough, though. Okay. Um, Tony Strobel. Um, you're talking about Mickey or, or, or the Ducks? Ducks. I don't really know Strobel's art that much. Um, yeah, that could I, I, be. I, it did. It didn't. What I remember, it doesn't didn't do much for me. Okay, this was like he was. He was kind of the Whitman era, wasn't he? Whitman comics. Could be. I you know I I really honed in on Barks material for the most part, and some European comics. Disney. Uh, comics. William Van Horn. Well, it will come as no surprise that I love Bill's work. Um, um, Bill is a double threat in that he's both an artist and a writer. Um, um, his style is looser and in some ways more idiosync idiosyncratic. I can't say it. Um, idiosyncratic. Idios <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you follow me around whenever I have trouble with the work? Um, <laughs> no, I have claim to her. She does that yeah, for me. <laughs> I do that for her. You know, as I get older, it's like, I got the beginning. How do I end that word? Um, and I know the word. It's just like, uh, anyway. Anyway, you were saying. Anyway, um, Bill, um, to really understand Bill, and you know, I worked, I've worked with Bill a lot. He, he and I are good friends. Um, uh, I'm doing, I've, I wouldn't be doing Disney comics probably if it wasn't for Bill. Uh, and I, I think he's, he's just a funny guy. Uh, I mean, in person, he's, he's, I think he's hilarious often, um, unless he's being real grumpy. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> Um, anyway, his, his uh, work has a very, um, a very whimsical quality to it. Right. it it's almost yeah. kind of like, um, um, at times it almost feels crazy, you know, almost feels like to a point of like, uh, you know, almost kind of like going back to like those old 1920s, almost like a crazy cat kind of, not, not that look, but almost just like the way the writing and stuff would just yeah. have a, almost a level of absurdity that was even a little beyond Karl Barks to a degree sometimes. Well, interesting that you mentioned crazy cat. I think you, that's what you were saying. Um, uh, um, Bill is heavily influenced by uh, uh, George... Um, What's Herman? This? Herman's crazy cat, thank you. Um, and when you look at his nervous wreck stories, you can see it right away, the backgrounds and and the humor. I see that humor. now. Honestly, I didn't I didn't say that because I thought you'd say that. That's interesting. So yeah. And huh. uh, it's no, I mean Bill's natural style is, and and his approach to storytelling is much more uh, crazy cat than it is Donald Duck. Mm. And when he brought that over to Donald Duck, he brought a very whimsical um, approach. Everything Bill does is whimsical. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm sure he doesn't take out the garbage whimsically, but his his stories are, mm -hmm. and um, he. Um, 
I think sometimes that's gotten him into trouble uh, where he, he gets, he kind of, well, let me put it this way. And at one point in my career, I decided to try to follow Bill's lead. And Bill, it's, um, um, what's, um, I can't think of the name of the TV series, but it, uh, TV series where nothing ever really happens. And, and um, anyway, um, so little happens in some of his stories. Um, there's, there's, you know, a def definite exciting thing that gets them into uh, some kind of trouble. But uh, particularly as later stories, they just kind of peter to an end. But I tried writing a couple of stories where I just kept the nephews and Donald at home and had as little happen as possible, just as kind of an experiment. It kind of worked out, but um, but at his best, Bill is Bill's stories are just beautiful, and um, mm -hmm. um, his his artwork is um, it's this weird melding of um, Karl Barks and George Harriman. Um, mm -hmm. Oh. Hmm. Um, Byron Erickson. <laughs> um, Byron doesn't get enough credit. Um, he, he um, I was initially submitting stories to Bill and then Byron was his editor and he became my editor. And um, uh, the only other editor I really had was Bob Foster for a couple of years at when I was doing Disney comics. And then I went over to Egmont and who's the editor in chief? It's Byron, you know, and he was my direct editor. And um, um, there, God, uh, there's at least one person who's done Disney comics, who um, owes a huge debt to Byron's ed editing. Let me put it, that's as far as I'll go on that. Mm -hmm. um, um, but uh, he's, a, he's a really good writer on his own. Um, he, when he went to Egmont, he, um, you know, he upped the quality of the stories tremendously. He brought in new people. He brought in Americans, but he also brought in people in Scandinavia uh, who were quite good. And because I've seen the European stories uh, or the Danish stories from before he got there, at least the ones I saw, and they were really bad. And at one point, Byron maybe a couple of points, Byron just threw away hundreds of pages just because they weren't any good, even though the Egmont had paid for it, uh, is my memory. Um, so, I think it's, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. No, it, and, I, I was and, just gonna and, say, I, I think if it wasn't for people like Byron Erickson, he's not the only one, but for people like that, he, he wouldn't have really people like yourself, like William Van Horn no. and such like that, because they just would have died away. I mean, it was people like him that actually made it. And what I mean, they would have died away. I mean, the comics would have died away. It, it, people like him brought them back and made these comics. Um, um, I, I shouldn't say awesome again, but like um, professional again. And right. like, right. I, I was talking to somebody the other, uh, just the other day uh, on a tweet exchange. And we were talking about comics as far as like, um, uh, um, I, I was commenting about the very first Karl Barks story I ever got and how it was just kind of random how I got that story. Didn't even know who Karl Barks was, um, never heard of him. And it was like my first exposure to him. And I was, eh, I think about 11. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just that the book that he did was really good. But at that time, when you're talking about Gladstone and stuff, they started adding in essays. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's the essays were almost as good as the story itself. And that was new to me because at that time I had been, I was reading like Richie Rich and Spider-Man and things like that. They didn't <laughs> do that. 
And it just gave it a little bit of more of a sense of adult. It made me feel more like an adult. Like I was sitting there and I was reading some real um, research uh, on top of the the comic itself. And I always found that very appreciative. Yes, and I I suspect a lot of the ones you were reading more by Jeff Bloom, who... uh, well, let's go ahead and do him next because he is on my list. So Jeff Bloom. Yeah, just just one more thing, but okay. Byron was the editor at Cloudstone, and he. Uh, and another thing is, uh, so he did. He, he's the one who, uh, Rosa, uh, came on board under. He's the one that Van Horn came on board under. He's the one I came on board. I was the third third one. Um, the only one who wasn't an, uh, an artist. And, but um, one thing that uh, a lot of people don't understand was that when they bring those European stories over, you know, and reprint them, you know, by Yippus or, you know, the draw, drawing by Yippus or, or whoever wrote and drew them, um, a lot of, a lot of, they almost always had to rewrite the stories. And I don't mean Yippus wrote these stories, but I mean uh, stories written by other creators because they didn't make much sense. And so I know Byron rewrote a bunch of stories. So Mm. it's sort of the last kiss approach to uh, doing the ducks in a way. Mm. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to get that in for him too. Um, So go ahead. So so Jeffrey Bloom. (laughs) Um, You know, Almost everybody who's worth their set, um, their who's worth anything in the duck community, at least at a certain a, a point, um, it was a curmudgeon. And Bill's kind of a curmudgeon. Uh, Byron's kind of a curmudgeon. Hmm. I don't know if I qualify for curmudgeon, but maybe I don't know. But Bill, uh, but Jeff is like the curmudgeon of all time. Um, um, I remember I was down, I think it was an early WonderCon, um, which uh, was, wasn't right in San Francisco, but it was nearby. It was, it was near where Jeff lived and I knew it. And I called him, I got his number and I called him and it was like, you know, I'm I'm doing the ducks now, and I'd I'd love to meet you. I've really, you know, I've read so many of your your pieces, and he goes like, "Oh yeah, sure." You know, it's like he was he he couldn't have been less interested. But eventually, we got to be uh, good friends, and I don't talk to him very much anymore. He's completely retired now, um, uh, and I he's think much happier. He's kind of the the face behind the the written word as far as right. towards the, these comics. I mean, he, a lot of the essays I was just talking about, he wrote. Right. Um, he would write all of this stuff, and and a lot of the research that I went into for this in preparation for this discussion, um, he wrote those as well. And it the is it's pretty dry reading and it's but it's really informative and it's just written like research paper like I'm almost just like picking up like issues of Blackstone and, or like books yeah, of Blackstone yeah. law and just like reading the law oh, and, Jeff, <laughs> yeah yeah um Jeff is very much an academic um uh although he's written some duck stories too uh his what Where what duck story Jordan? would I know that he wrote? Was there one that well, it'd be later stuff. I think he rewrote some stories just as uh, Byron did, and uh, um, Gary Leach, uh, uh, Sue Sue uh, Sue's husband, um, the colorist, um, I think might have written some too. But um, Jeff wrote some ones that he sold to Egmont, and I don't know that they've been reprinted over here or not. So, um, um, did, I don't think he wrote a lot uh, for Egmont. I mean, uh, for that, but he put together a whole nother Barks library uh, for uh, for um, the licensed 
one of the European licensees uh, with all new essays and so forth, I think, or a lot of new material anyway. Wow. And uh, his family was, I don't know if both of his parents were British or not. I think he kind of grew up in somewhere in, in Asia, I mean, for, for a while and so forth. And um, he's a um, bit of a prickly pear, but I, I, I really like Jeff. Um, mm. But um, it's, it's, he's not going to cozy up to, <laughs> to a lot of people just for the heck uh -huh. of it. All right, next, Don Rosa. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I thought you might, um, um, well, I, I, okay, let me put it this way. Um, um, I thought we might talk about him. I had to think about what to, what to say. Um, Don and I don't like each other personally, and uh, I don't think he likes my work, and I don't like... Uh, a lot of his work. I like some of his work. Um, uh, we had a falling out at one point, uh, not that we were ever close, and I don't think it's a good idea to get into all the details of that. What I like of his is, are his early um, short pieces, actually, is uh, I think, and, and this sounds like I'm being facetious, but I'm not. I think he's an excellent gag. Uh, he's excellent with gags, uh, gag, the mechanics of gags and so forth. And I thought he did great job on those. Um, and his early long stories were fine. Um, and, you know, and they were groundbreaking and so forth, but um, I, I think, I guess I'll, I, I, I didn't care for him rehashing Barks, and and I guess I'll go ahead and say this: Barks didn't care for it either. Um, um, in a way, uh, Don was re almost rewriting Barks because no, we're you, referring to his life and times of Scrooge. Well, it's Scrooge not just that about. the life and times was. Um, uh, one thing, and, and I don't think Carl enjoyed having everything connected together. And as a creator, I don't like to have everything locked together the way, like superhero comics do, you know, yeah. where they're referring to... See uh, issue such and such. Right, 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 right. right. Um, which Marvel was great at, and... and, and um, um, really gave it uh, an extra layer but um but when you get into superhero comics the continuity eventually always sinks them and they have to redo things and they're they're moving the timeline up to um you know this really happened in 1997 instead of 1962 or something you know um um and so I, yeah, Don and I have a different sensibility about things and I fully recognize the popularity of his work and he's by far the biggest star in uh, the duck, in um, modern uh, duckdom. Um, so, you know, we just have a different approach. We didn't click on a personal level um, um, for a variety think, of reasons. I think one of the things I really like with his work, and, and it is it is very different from Karl Marx, right. but it, that's just, it's just different. That doesn't make it bad or better, um, yeah. it's just different. And I like his level of research mm -hmm. to a degree mm -hmm. that he would put into, uh, like no one was doing that to even like the level like Barks was. In fact, you could probably say Don Rosa was doing even more than Barks was as far as mm -hmm. the, the I think that's research. Very fair. It's probably also safe to say there's never been any other artist or writer working on, on 
on the docks that had that was more of a fan of Barks than Don Rosa because like he he was just such a fan of his even growing up as a child reading his stuff. Right. That doesn't mean that the other people we're talking about didn't res- have immense respect for Karl Barks. I'm not. That's not my point at all. It's just that he's kind of like the first fanboy to get this part, you know? Yeah. And um, also, as far as art styling, because his art styling is vastly different than Karl Barks. Personally, I don't have a problem with it because it is vastly different, but I'm okay with that um, on his work. I know that people have made, like, connections to like it's kind of like a, a Robert Crumb style and I believe that even Don Rose has bristled at that you know not uh, uh, that that comparison I think it does have a Robert Crumb kind of style. again I don't mind that I, I, I it's it's just it's a, it's a very different approach to how the, the characters are de- being done but in but in Don Rose's interpretation of the world it works now, right. if everybody was just trying to make the, the, the interpretation of D- Donald of Duckburg and and the Ducks like Karl Barks, then it wouldn't be as interesting to me um, if we were trying to be so closely cloning of Karl Barks. So that's just kind of my take of it. I think that as far as the adventure story goes, he's doing it the best after Karl Barks. As far as things like with the life and times and dealing with like dates, I don't get as hung up on that. I, it's just the kind of thing, like I know, it seems like from what I've read, Karl Barks felt really strongly to a degree that these things really shouldn't be pegged into anything, that they need to remain, I think the work he used was timeless and stuff like that. And um, I, I think they're timeless on their own. I don't think it necessarily hurts whether there's a date to them or not. I mean, we're, we're talking about architecture and these kind of adventures that almost kind of date themselves to a, to a point anyway, I, um, as far as kind of like in a, in, in a time period that they most likely would have happened. And certainly the, his art stylings, Karl Barthes' art stylings, do kind of date just based off of the art stylings themselves and the way different things are drawn. It's just my take on it that way. I, I kind of, it's not my preferred sort of art style, but I'm, if I view it as an alternative universe of the ducks, which I kind of do, it doesn't particularly bother me. Um, um, it's, a, the only thing that does kind of bother me is that it's, I wish every pa- I wish there were some more quiet panels in his art, and <laughs> they weren't all like yeah. like every every panel is like designed as if it's the high highlight of that story. And mm-hmm. uh, but um, yeah, I you know I don't want to start a, a fight with Don, and and um, you know we just have different opinions. And but uh, as you say, he is after Karl Barks the second most famous. Oh yeah, other people. No, I mean, no he deserves question. to be discussed in this list because oh, yeah. it would be yeah, a dereliction sure. not to. And um, yeah, and so his work really belongs in the annals of um, of the Duckburg Times, so to speak. <laughs> um, so, um, Daniel Bronca. Um. I was lucky enough to have Bronca draw my stories a couple of times, and uh, I really like his stuff. Again, um, I know late in his career, it was getting looser and more frantic, and that did bother some people. Uh, It was almost more cartoony. Um, Somebody said he was trying to make up for deficiencies in the script when he was doing that. I don't know if that's true, but I liked what he did in my stories. And uh, uh, he's a great, great artist. I was fortunate enough to meet him and uh, meet Vicar and uh, some of the other greats uh, at Egmont. A couple of, let's see, it was just that one Egmont conference, yeah. 
I, I know very, very little about Bronco, other than, you know, his name's kind of just stands out. So it's a unique name. But um, I, I, I have to admit, I, I know very, very little about him. When I met him, he was old and kind of thin. And um, I think he died shortly, you know, I mean, within a very few years later. Um, um, but he was, was his time he, period for stories then? When, when was I he? Can't, I can't him? tell you. I, I, can't, I can't tell you. I, I just uh, knew he drew a couple of my stories and he did a great job. Um, where is it? This, this is one of the stories he drew of mine. Um, yeah. I have to um, bring that in pretty tight. Yeah. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, it's a it's a much tighter interpretation, particularly when we're talking about the people. It's almost right, like his people, people are a lot people different. Were, yes, his people were very. Oh, there was a the camera. Um, they were funny people, you know. Um, the way, like the people and like the hands and stuff, it almost has a little bit of like a like an asterisk or a lucky Luke feel to the styling. Mm -hmm. that, would, that would be, again, very European. What was his nationality? Where was he from? I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Um, it's from, really tight. Yeah. Well, there like you were talking tight. about it like, later, uh, like later, later on, on it was getting looser. But I think later later it. on it got looser. But, yeah. um, or, or more, maybe more outrageous would be the... Uh, you can, Maybe yeah. more outrageous. Um, hmm. uh, I think I actually provided a sketch of this robot to the uh, to the artist. Um, uh, I mean, when I sent it in, and I didn't know it was going to. Again, you never knew who you were going to get when you when you drew for Egmont for the most cases. But um, Vicar. Again, I met Vicar. Uh, I. I enjoyed his artwork. Uh, I know it looked maybe a little too polished to some people, and it was very polished. And he worked with assistants, and so it probably, you know, it wasn't pure Vicar. Um, but um, I got to I got to know him. He was the one master that I spent the most time with, uh, the master artist, and. We got along really well, and um, I liked him quite a bit. But of of all the artists who've drawn the ducks, uh, I don't think anybody drew as close to Carl's style in some ways as as Vicar. But oh. it, it was a very it was a Even very more so than Yippas. In some ways, it but it was a very polished. I mean, Yippas is is looser and. Um, could be, Yippus is almost between Branca and Vicar. I mean, he, he, he brought the look of Barks, but he could, he could push it further. Uh, Vicar was always a little more refined and wasn't as frantic. And um, it was probably too tame for some people, but um, Boy, he was their, really their house artist, uh, mm. house artist and for many years. And Very prolific, right? Like he was producing a lot of stuff. Oh, huge. Probably one. because with the assistance and all that, he was almost his own studio. Yeah, I, I've um, actually the artist I work, one of the art, people I work with for uh, Last Kiss uh, knew the car uh, quite well. And um, um was Vicar in Argentina too? They were both in South. They're both in South America. Um, but anyway, but yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, Pat and Shelley Block. <laughs> uh, they're friends. Um, um, I, you know, uh, Pat has developed into. I think is. Some of his early duck stuff was a little uh, rough, but 
man, he has developed into uh, a fantastic artist. And I see his painting, his duck paintings and, and so forth. And it does amazing things. With they're, they're just, it, do, it does amazing. And, and um, uh, I like both of them. Um, Shelly, I, I, I like both of them, but Shelly, I absolutely love. She's just a kick. Mm. And she used to um, go to San Diego and she'd 